Hello and welcome to today's live stream. We're so excited for you to join us. If you could do us a favor, go ahead and put where you're joining us from in the comments below. Looks like we already have a few people joining us with less than two and a half minutes left. Do me a favor and you about five or six people that have joined us, let us know where you're joining from. I have been waiting for this live stream all week and super excited to talk to some friends of mine, Brandon and 
Jack from Panasonic as we talk about advanced video. So do me a favor and let me know where you're joining us from as we kick off here. We always want to see kind of where these live streams are getting out to. And so far we have uh, one person, Mr. Christopher Gilbert of Fujifilm fame. He is joining us from Flavortown, Columbus, Ohio. So hello to Chris. I hope you're having a great day. And I hope you enjoyed your uh, warm up music there. So just some quick notes before we get started. Uh, we are still open here at the store. Uh, we are open uh, 10 to 7 Monday through Friday and 10 to 5 on Saturday. And if you don't feel comfortable coming inside the store, that is totally fine. We have thousands of items on our website that are available for free shipping, or we also do curbside pickup. So, you know, whatever works for you, just give us a call, let us know, and we will get you taken care of. Um, also, if there is a live stream that you want to see, also let me know that. You can shoot me an email at social at thepixelconnection.com, and I will make sure that I meet those uh, unmet needs and make sure that we have a live stream that talks directly to you. So if you are going to join us in our store, uh, I just want to let you know a few things that are going on. First and foremost is we are doing you know, our best to keep everything disinfected. Uh, we've gone through so much uh, sanitization product to make sure that the store is clean and you feel comfortable when you come in. Uh, anytime someone, you know, uses a camera, we wipe it down. Uh, we have hand sanitizer there. Uh, we make sure all of our employees are, you know, symptom free. Uh, we wear masks at all the time. We make sure that all customers wear masks at all times. Uh, six foot. I mean, we're doing everything that we can in order to make everybody feel comfortable. So I uh, just want to let you know that if you do come in the store, there are some changes. Um, but again, it makes it easy. You can still browse around. You can still see um, get a feel for different cameras, bags, whatever it is, uh, you still can come into the store. So what are our goals for today? Well, first and foremost is to pull you away from what I call the FUD, the fear, the uncertainty, and the doubt uh, that goes on around us. You know, everything everything is changing day by day when it comes to, you know, COVID, politics, all this. And my goal is to pull you away from that, even if it is for an hour to talk about something that you love or want to get to know a little bit more about such as video. And this is one of our most requested topics is just to get a little bit more information on video. So uh, that's what we're here to do. And I want to make sure that I can pull you away from that. And then also, I want to get you motivated to try something new, something that is outside of your comfort zone, because that's where the magic happens. That's where we see true growth within our skill set is once we step outside of that comfort comfort zone. And who knows, I might help you discover a new niche that could become profitable in the future. So maybe you've been thinking about adding on uh, different video services like rap videos to your service, you know, weddings and rap videos. Perfect business. This is definitely the live stream that you want to watch. Uh, so that way you can become more profitable in the future. As always, if you have any questions or anything, you can email me at social at thepixelconnection.com and we will be able to get those questions answered for you. So I'm going to shut up for a little bit as I bring in our guests here, our guests of honor, if you will. Um, we have Lumix Jack and Brandon from Lumix. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing great, TJ. Can you? It's good to be here. Excellent. Thank You're you so great. much for taking time out of your day. Um, Ironically, I'm coming from Houston to talk to TJ Houston. <laughs> Well, ho hopefully, Houston, we will have no problems today with the live stream. No, hopefully, everything and goes smooth. Magic, I hope you teach us some tricks as well. <laughs> Excellent. We well, already don't have the uniform names, which bothers me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been like formally Lumix TJ Houston. I know. Jeez. So, Brandon, go ahead. If you want to share your screen, we will get that up there. Uh, while you're doing that, I want to say hello to Mr. Brad Cohen. Oh, I'm sorry, Brad Cohn uh, from Mentor Ohio. Hello, Brad. Um, hello, Mr. Mike Robel coming at us from Copley, Ohio, my trusty co-host for our weekly news show. Hello, Mr. Mike Robel, also known as Dad Cooks Dinner. So go ahead and go full screen, Brandon, and then I will add that to the stream. And as Bre Brandon does this, I'm sure Brad would love to just to say if you're if you're looking for anything in this presentation, Pixel Connection is one of our favorite partners in the world. Love Raul, Matt, and, and TJ as well. Also, um, if we'll have questions at the end. So if anyone has questions, please ask them in the chat. Absolutely. Looking good. Good. And let me get rid of that lower third so that cleans up a little bit. Boom. Okay. You guys are all set. Well, great. So um, it's great being a part of Pixel. You know, it's one of the one of the accounts we really miss visiting. Um, you know, that's 
it's, it's a great thing. But that's the great thing that TJ, TJ has mentioned is we can talk about some amazing video and Brendan and I kind of will walk you through some of the how to get better footage out of your G-Series camera or if it's a camcorder like our X2000 or even a point and shoot. The idea is to either aspire to something new, grow into something new, or to use what you have to get some better results. Yeah, and again, a big shout out to Pixel Connection for making this happen. So, so last minute, but again, you guys are always the best, especially you, TJ. We love you. We miss you. Great. And Brandon, you can control the, the tempo. Just go for it. Great. Yeah. All right. So what do we want to accomplish today? So this is a very video uh, heavy presentation that we're doing today, Jack. This is, we'll focus on a lot of professional video topics, I'm pretty sure, right? Oh, absolutely. So the great thing about video is even before this, it's a growing part of our industry. So you have people like Brandon who um, definitely come from a photography background. You get people from TJ with photography background, Brad, uh, you know, getting better at photography every day and trying and, but more and more people are trying to learn the, how to get those photographic skills to translate into video. And this is a really interesting thing because as you know, TJ alluded to, I've shot a, a lot of things for a very long time and I come from a live production or concert background and I've shot a lot of videos. Um, I've created some f cinematic footage, but people like Brandon who are really getting into video, not only for some of the professional aspects, I know you do a lot of portraiture, Brandon, but also you're trying to capture video of your family. Yeah. And that's, that's really one of the primary things nowadays is that I'm, I'm, I take a lot of photos, take tens of thousands of photos uh, every year, but I want to make sure that I, I have some other types of media to preserve that. And that's where the video really comes into that. And, you know, video has the ability to put you in the situation, hearing voices, hearing sounds, things that are familiar to you really kind of put you in that moment that a, that a photo can do, but not quite as well as something with video. And one of the things you kind of noticed is, you know, the workflow is totally different, whether it's something we want to be cinematic, whether it's something we're live, or even when we talk about our new streaming functionality with our Tether app, that's a totally different workflow than you were probably used to. Absolutely. So Jack, the big myth about for video, what kind of sensor would you be using? We have Panasonic ourselves offer micro four thirds. We have full frame cameras. What's the big deal with sensor size in terms of video performance? Well, and what I would say is there is no perfect sensor size. If there was one perfect sensor size, we would only sell one style of camera and what a boring world that would be. So in ph photographic terms, people think of sensor sizes bigger is better. And in video, that might be the case. That might be not be the case. But let's kind of talk about that. So historically, if you were going to shoot 35 millimeter film, for a photo, it would be full frame. And that's going to be kind of as you see right there, you see the sprockets. But if you were going to shoot video or technically film, it would actually be what's called Super 35. Super 35 is actually a 35 fr millimeter frame rotated. And that extra space allowed audio to be encoded. What I'm telling you is that we have an incredible toolbox of different cameras that are all great for different things. So full frame is a great photographic sensor. It is a great sensor if you're going to want the best possible low light, if you're going to want the shallowest depth of field. But let's say that you wanted something like a music video or web streaming. You know, Brandon, when you started shooting video with a full frame sensor, I bet you were having to fight depth of field a lot. Yeah, uh, so we do a lot of the videos that are based you know, right here in our homes and we're recording ourselves for tips and tricks videos that we make for Panasonic and eternally. And that was the big thing is that, you know, if I'm shooting at a 50 millimeter one four, the amount of, uh, of depth of field in bokeh is just tremendous. Um, and it makes it a little difficult. You know, it could be somewhat distracting, especially if you're doing like a talking head video. Absolutely. And if you're moving a camera, the smaller a sensor it is, generally speaking, all things being equal, the faster it'll read out. So if you're going to do something and you wanted to move the camera on, say, a gimbal, uh, having something like a micro four third sensor, which is a two times crop, will allow it to have significantly faster readout speeds. Now, again, we talked about Super 35. That's APS-C equivalent. You would find that on our very cams. That's somewhere in the middle. And that's one of the advantages of full frame is that you can shoot in four in a full width readout, or you can crop into Super 35. The other kind of sensor that's very popular is going to be something like a camcorder, where and that's actually going to be a very small sensor. And then, now that sensor is going to be a little bit bigger than a point-and-shoot, 
the advantage of a sensor like that is you won't fight depth of field, and then you're going to have tremendous zoom. If I'm shooting documentary videos, I like having a smaller sensor because I know that I can't reshoot the footage and everything will always be sharp in frame. And if I have to zoom the camera or I have to whip and pan the camera, everything's going to remain sharp. Yeah, and that's a big thing, Jack, is moving around the camera and not having to deal with any any issues or artifacts you might be getting by those those pans that you're doing. And this is kind of what we talked about. Now, the reason why we mentioned the X2000 here is there's a, there's a belief that a lot of cameras don't have unlimited record time. And the reason why that's a myth is many, many Panasonic cameras do support unlimited record times because they were thermally designed for it. So that could be something as uh, simple as a G85 or a G95, a GH5. We're not quite right there yet, Brandon. Um, a GH, um a G95, GH5, S1, S1H. They all have re unlimited record times as well as our camcorders. And that's because they're thermally designed for this. Again, you can record flat out and you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to worry about ever having to stop footage. My father, for example, is a professor. And as much as his students wishes, wish he would stop talking after 29 minutes and 59 seconds, those lectures need to go on. So really think about that and really ask the people you talk to what cameras have unlimited record times and how can that benefit you? Now, one of the advantages for interchangeable lens cameras is they can be adapted to other lenses, whether that's an autofocus lens or a manual focus lens. Yeah, and the, the camcorders themselves are a kind of an all-in-one solution, especially with the with a camcorder like the one pictured down below. It's kind of an all-in-one studio. You're getting Wi-Fi capabilities, you're getting multiple fast uh, lenses and amazing ability to stay in focus. Yeah, and the audio is going to be better. And that's one of the great things about this is, you know, it's got dual XLR audio in the X2000. But if you wanted that functionality, you could totally buy an XLR1 adapter and add it to a GH5 or a GH5S or um, an S-series camera and get, you know, amazing results. Now, one of the advantages of mirrorless, Brandon, is that you can use adapters. And I know that you've actually been adapting f a lot of classic lenses because they give you different looks. Yeah, the the look of older optics, you know, whether and again, they're not going to have the kind of corrections that you would normally get in modern glass themselves, but they do give a certain kind of vintagey look. Or sometimes you may want some of those chromatic aberrations that you would get to give it a, a kind of a context or a certain period kind of look to the glass itself. What yeah, you're filming? Absolutely. And if you are going to use an adapter, make sure to get the right adapter, not just one that's compatible, but one that's really built well. And then we'll have the ability to have firmware updates if it's an autofocus camera. For example, on the Micro Four Thirds, a lot of people use Metabones. Um, for the L mount product, a lot of people use the Sigma adapter. One of the things I really like about the Sigma adapter for um, L to EF is that they've done a lot of firmware updates. Yeah, and again, something like uh, the firmware updates, you want to make sure you're checking the website of the company that you bought it from. And Metabones is a fantastic company that does a lot of firmware updates and to always sometimes they even add features and compatibility with the cameras themselves. Now, you're, you're probably not going to get the same level of autofocus control. And that's, again, because most times the motors that you would adapt were not designed for continual autofocus. So at getting native adapt. A native lens is also has some advantages too, both in terms of autofocus speed and performance, stabilization, and things like that. Now, Brandon, what do you um, what do you like in terms of lenses going forward? Well, we happen to have a slide that shows that, Jack. So the best lenses that I've used uh, on the Panasonic system for video are going to be the 12 to 35, the 35 to 100, and my new favorite is the 10 to 25 one seven. That lens in particular is effectively a couple different primes in one, so it's kind of my one single lens solution that I have to bring around with me. Yeah, and, and that's one of those things where photographers are really – spoiled now as we get into video because we have the ability to have all these great constant aperture lenses that's something like that 12 to 35 or 35 to 100 we also are going to have s series lenses as well for the l mount there'll be constant aperture so you don't have to worry about exposure changing as you zoom in and out now you are I tend to be a zoom guy um you love the fact that yeah as we talked about you can adapt lenses one of the great things to note, though, if you are getting a, a lens or pixel connection, is that you want to also ask, is it a lens video optimized? And by that, do, I mean, do things like the aperture blades not sh uh, flicker or shutter as you're changing your aperture? Often, a lot of photographic lenses were never designed to change aperture during a video. And again, you'll see a little strobing effect that you really can't fix in post. You kind of have to cut away from.
And again, if you are using non Panasonic lenses, one of the best lenses that's out there, and it, it seems to be on most of the cameras uh, that I encounter and out in the field is going to be the 18 to 35 Sigma, which again is a, a fantastic EF to micro four thirds adapted lens that's out there. Now, let's say that, you know, as much Brandon, Brandon loves zooms, I love primes. The, what I like so much is, and this is for our, our G series, but we also have some great lenses available for our S series, is that we have a Lumix lens as cheap as less than $200, that 25 millimeter 1.7. It's just a gorgeous optic and then allows you to really think with your feet and compose. I know my buddy Kevin has... Who, visits pixel connection quite often you know he's shot great documentaries just using the 2517 and that's because it's really sharp renders really well it's a great starter lens as you uh, move up you can go to a 1.4 so that's going to have more light gathering capabilities better coatings and we just have a tremendous variety uh, for micro four thirds we've got more than 32 lenses and for the g series we're you know we're we're close down to a dozen or gosh we're close as a system between Panasonic, Sigma, and Leica to, gosh, around 40 lenses. And Jack, most of the lenses that are on the screen are very inexpensive and extremely small. You can almost fit every single one of these lenses into a single small bag. Yeah, absolutely. Like the biggest lens here, which is the 42.512, um, the Noctocron, that was basically the size of a, of a soft drink. So it's, it's a very small, compact lens that you can take anywhere. Yeah, even on the camera body, I got to say that lens in particular is smaller than my 24 to 70 2.8 um, on a full frame equivalent. Now, speaking of uh, a full frame and building the image, Jack, we're, we're looking at a really complex setup that we're seeing here uh, from one of our Lumix ambassadors um, who does fantastic work, which is Griffin Hammond. Now, building the image, let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. With well, the idea we're talking about this is building images, what look are we trying to achieve? Now, most video that we are going to record we really have to think about the final product before we shoot it because we're talking about streams of information. So you can't reshoot, recompose all the time. That's very jarring. So first we have to ask, what kind of look are we trying to achieve? Um, the first person color, holding a color chart, that's probably something that's more cinematic. Sometimes you want something that looks like a documentary shoot. And then sometimes you want like a live event feel, whether it's sports or a concert like I would shoot. I really want you know that music to sound great and alive like I was at a concert when I can go to a concert again. So yeah, choosing what we want to do is a question of choosing the right camera, the right lens, but just as importantly, because everything is so versatile, it's about choosing color, frame rate, and other things. Now, I believe personally that frame rates are one of the most fundamentally important building blocks of your image. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, they're going to determine the cadence or your look of your video. How often have you heard about you know something not looking cinematic? Well, we can tell the second something is cinematic looking or not cinematic moving, uh, looking by the way someone moves or where the, when you move the camera. Now, Brandon, film has always had a 24 frame um, cadence for a really long time, and that's because it's a really impactful um, dramatic cinematic look, right? And and why is that? So film itself, it's the, the way the movement is going to be captured. And, and film, like you said, has always been that, that standard. If you go too fast, it kind of looks like you're watching a daytime soap opera where the motion just, it looks like you're, uh, you're looking at like a camcorder footage or, or some lower grade footage. It just doesn't have the same movement or flow to it. It doesn't have the same movement because you don't have a lot of frames. 24 frames is really the height of analog technology that we've carried forward. And that's the look we're used to. Even the, you know one of the TV shows here is shot on... 24 frames and then converted to 30 to make it look more film like when it was on TV. Now, luckily with streaming, you can actually present now at all these other frame rates. So when would I use each? Well, 24p will look cinematic. It will also give you the best low light performance because I'm going to be able to balance my shutter speed. 30 frames per second is probably the most common thing you see and most web videos are shot that way. And then sporting events and then some news broadcasts, things that are, need to be really fluid and capture motion. You know, this would be great for your cat videos if you want to make it really fluid. Those are shot at a high frame rate, usually at 60 frames per second. Now, Brendan, if I was going to do something that was fast moving and I, my camera only shot 4K at 30 frames per second, but it could do 1080p at 60 frames per second, which would you choose? I would always choose the 1080p at the 60 because I would need to be able to keep up with the motion that's going on the screen. Yeah, it'd be a little bit way more sharp and fluid. And then if you also needed to slow it down for slow-mo, the more frames you have to work with, 
the more deliberate it can look. Yeah, and that's the big thing. It can always be done in post. So this is the detail slide that we have about frame rate changes. And one of the big things is, Jack, you don't necessarily want to be changing your frame rate or be using two different cameras at different frame rates. Why is that? Well, if you first of all, if you are going to change your, your frame rate, you got, it's got to be an artistic choice. you got to really think about what you're doing. And that's because if you mix and match footage, two things are going to happen. One, you're going to have audio drift. And this is really important because some cameras, like a GH5 or an S1H, GH5S, you'll have the ability to go into the cinema mode and it can shoot in true 24 or 2398. Now, if I took one camera and I used my B camera and it was 2398 and then my other camera, my A camera was 24, eventually you're going to get some audio drift and, and that's going to be very, very noticeable. But most importantly, if I switched in a timeline between 24, 30 and 60, it's going to be massively different looking in terms of motion and will be visually distracting. A lot of those looks that you've, of changing frame rate, you can probably accomplish in shutter speed. Now, Brandon, you, you, you now shoot in shutter angle because if you shoot in shutter angle, your shutter speed is automatically adjusted every time you change the frame rate. What is shutter angle and why is it important? So as a rule of thumb, uh, shutter angle is described as the blur that you would get between frames themselves. So the accepted standard for shutter angle is always 180 degree shutter angle. And that's what, what pretty much what most professionals will use as a standard um, increment. When filming. And that will be a true, if you're shooting at 24 frames per second, that will allow you to get to a, a true 48th of a second. And again, so that if you want something filmic, not only is your frame rate going to be great, but your shutter speed will be perfect and consistent. Um, what I think I like about shutter angle, though, is, again, if I'm changing, let's say, from 180 frames per second in slow-mo down to 24 frames per second, because I'm going to put them together on a timeline, I don't have to adjust my shutter speed for my frame rate. If I leave it at 180, it's always going to keep it perfectly matched. You can change these things um, if you change your shutter speeds. Um, I really like this in an environment. You know, I'm, I'm hoping to come back to Pixel Connection someday soon. And when we're going to shoot under those lights, what we'll have to do occasionally is we're going to have to set our synchro scan. And using our shutter angle, I can get into very small increments for things like the monitors don't uh, strobe behind me. That's a that's a big problem in a lot of streaming video that you don't tend to see when you're watching stuff when TJ does it. The other thing is, if, if you change your shutter speed a little bit, you can actually over crank or under crank and to get better motion. Um, uh, Brendan's just had his new son, TJ, and when he's wrestling around with TJ to make, uh, sorry, with, not TJ, sorry, with uh, Hudson, um, he's making them, he can actually adjust shutter speed just a little bit to make the action seem a little bit faster and more dramatic. Absolutely. Now, this is shutter angle explained in detail, Jack, and let's try to make this as simple as possible for people. Sure, that was a good segue. So um, what this is, yeah. is think of it as a, shutter, as a, a mechanical shutter is a, uh, in a movie camera does not open and close like a photographic shutter. It's essentially a metal plate that's rotating. And that's because if you had a mechanical shutter and you were shooting at 24 frames per second, you would do totally burn out a shutter. So what this is actually doing is if you go to 180, it's doing half of an exposure that's exposed. The other half of the exposure is not exposed. And again, that will allow you to have that half percent exposure, non-exposure, and that will give you an even balance of light and dark. If I was at 90% shutter angle, you'd see that a quarter of that exposure would happen. And again, that the rest of it would not. And again, I'm starting to slow motion. 45 um, degree shutter angle, again, this is a circle, would basically allow me to freeze motion still. Yeah, and essentially, to summarize that, Jack, as, as easily as possible, 180 degrees shutter angle is the only one that's going to have the most consistent exposure between both sides of the frame. It's evenly balanced. Absolutely. Now, workflow. Now, we look at the, the the cameras that we have on the left-hand side there. That's a lot of different things. We have professional camcorders. We have Micro Four Thirds or full-frame cameras. And Panasonic even makes a lot of cinema cameras. Yeah, if you've seen a Netflix production, um, you're going to find a lot of our products. And that, one of the great things about Panasonic in terms of the workflow is that we're going to have, generally speaking, very consistent color. Consistent c codecs are very, very close. And widespread... Uh, wide ranging software support. So I think we can go to the next slide because it really is showing 
how the evolution of this is changing. Back when I started at Panasonic, man, I, I started before we had mirrorless cameras. The world was an 8-bit world for most video, and that meant I had a very finite box of crayons. Not only was resolution increasing, um, we were also seeing color space increasing. So by the time you see here is we transitioned between 422 8-bit, and don't worry, we'll explain that in a little bit what 422 means. We went from 8-bit color and 1080p, or 2 megapixels, to 1080p at 10-bit color, then all the way to 4 gig. K as well as 10-bit color. And this has also happened on the consumer side, where starting with the GH4, we uh, really transitioned our product line from an 8-bit color space to a 10-bit color space on the semi-pro and, and pro lines. Yeah, so again, we're making solutions. So we're having consumer-level cameras that also can match a lot of the performance and work within a workflow of professional applications. Absolutely. I think we make it an affordable option for everyone. Now, why does recording all of this properly really important? Well, because we were going to have industry standards. Now, you don't have to follow this menu as, as you know perfectly, but if you do, this is what a company like the Post Technology Alliance from Netflix would ask for. They would ask for a certain standard. Why? Because it's not about having this video look good today. It's about having this video good look good for a long period of time. And if you are going to shoot for something for a provider like Netflix, they will not underwrite production unless you have a certain level of quality. You can always sell content to them, but they won't underwrite it. And the higher quality your project is, the longer it's going to remain relevant, the more it's going and the more people are going to watch it long term. This is why most high-end YouTube series are actually shot in 4K is about the permanence. People are not going to stop wondering how do I cook an eggs Benedict, but they are going to want to watch videos on that look good on their devices today, tomorrow, and in the far future. Now, now Brandon, when we're shooting this for Netflix, they're going to ask for 4K, and we'll talk about the various types eventually. They're going to want it exposed in V-Log, so they're going to want a really wide dynamic range. They're going to want a really low compression rate, so it's going to be a 422 10-bit all-eye codec, and that means, yes, the video is going to be about 4 gigs a minute, but they don't care whether you're shooting in full frame or Super 35. No, hey, that, Jack, that, what that, is all-eye? What does that mean? All intra. We'll, we'll get into it in a, in a bit, but every frame is its own snowflake, and this is really important because Having distinct frames means that when you have to edit it later, not only is it going to be smoother, it's going to be less susceptible to artifacts and noise. So let's say that my comedy gets much better than it is, and I wanted to take that into a club. If I'm actually walking in front of a brick wall, and I'm using a traditional non-eye codec, what you'll see is a little bit of loss of sharpness because it's the codec strobes as I walk past it. All I means it's going to draw not just me as I move, it's going to redraw the brick wall at the same time. So it's a much larger but less compressed file format. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we'll get into a little later, Jack, as you mentioned, is that while the file sizes might be bigger, the ability to edit them on non-higher end PCs or, or Macs will be significantly easier to do. Yeah, absolutely. And if you ever see why people use recorders, um, it's because they're going to get less computationally intensive files. And Jack, one thing to point out on the slide that we, we do want to call out that the S1H, uh, our full frame, I guess, quasi cinema camera that we have is a Netflix certified camera. Yeah, I mentioned that, and I wouldn't say quasi. It is a it is a cinema camera. That's the greatest thing is that this thing is actually being used right now in productions all across the world. Yeah, and this is something again you can buy at retail your at, uh, at Pixel Connection themselves and uh, walk right in and leave with it the same day if you want it. So why do we compress things? We're not going to belabor this slide. The reason why we compress things is because you need them to be smaller to be worked with, and there's a lot of redundancy in images. So if I'm going to do something like a you know, a normal scene, if I had it uncompressed, it's going to be 10 gigabits per second that, that, that up to. It, it's massive. And then again, I want to compress it down to something significantly smaller to work with. Smaller data, easier to work with, and not really a loss of data due to the way that we see moving images. So 4K, Jack, 4K seems to be the standard that uh, we, we would actually recommend most people film in if they have the ability to do that versus 1080p. Yeah, absolutely. So um, 
an S one H could actually shoot in four in five point nine K if you'd like to. But four K is now the benchmark. You know, people can exceed it if they'd like. Um, if you want to shoot anamorphic, it might be a tiny bit more or a tiny bit less. But that is the general standard. Um, and we are really pleased in most of our um, professional cameras, we can support ultra high definition or cinema 4K. Now, a provider like Netflix will support both, but you'll notice that there are two slight differences. One that you're going to find is that ultra high definition is the same aspect ratio as smart devices, TVs, tablets, smartphones, and it's a 169 aspect ratio. Um, it has video tends to be encoded at 2398. That is the NTSC standard. This is what TV will be broadcast. But Brandon, you, you have a huge um, fondness for projected films. So you actually also like cinema 4K, which is a little bit wider. Yeah, and if you're going to be filming something for production or going to be shown into a, a theater itself, Cinema 4K is the industry standard, and that's what they'll be using. And the one thing I do like about Cinema 4K, it does give me the ability to crop in on post if I wanted to, just that little extra leeway. And why is it the standard? We kind of talked about production. Is It's a demand for content to look better longer. You know, a lot of the TV shows that we watched in reruns were never shot in high definition, and it shows. Whereas a show like Seinfeld was shot on film, scanned, and it looks far better. But beyond that, you'll be able to reduce moray. Um, what I like to be able to do is if I'm shooting something, that, let's say someone has a really loud shirt, and I need to reduce and make it sharper, what I can actually do is shoot in 4K and down convert to 1080p. I can use um, the ability to, to pan within frame. So let's say that I needed to do a sliding shot, but I didn't have the ability because of permits to put a slider down. Well, what I could do is I could use a monopod and use HD cropping. So I can basically get a really smooth pan out of a 4K master. Um, for that, I tend to like to shoot really wide. My favorite lens for that is our 8 to 18 um, that we make. Um, and on, I also like our 16 to 35 for full frame. You can also use warp stabilization. Warp stabilization allows you to take a really kind of jerky, stuttery video that doesn't look fluid and then down convert it to a really good 1080p content. And it's about future proofing, Brandon, because you know you have things like uh, Hudson where you want it to look better longer so you can share with your family. Yeah, and, and not to mention if I'm doing commercial work, if I'm do, doing something for a client, if I have the ability to have a 4K master and they're only looking at it on a mobile, but then later on they might come up and tell me that they want to see that same video on a larger screen or, or something else, and they have the higher uh, res file to work with as well. And that's a big thing. So the next, code oh, go ahead. Go ahead, the next thing we're looking at is codecs. Now, there's a ton of different codecs that are available out there. Some of them will be uh, things that come in, in point and shoot ones, something will be in micro four thirds, um, and even in the cinema line, we'll have different codecs. We're looking at all these different types of codecs, H.264, 265. Uh, let me let me tee you up again, and let's talk about Codex. Sure, I, I thought Codex was out of business. I'm joking. Codex is. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, no, um, Code first of all, Codex is well in business making film, but Codex, Codex are going to be um, a way to compress data that's large and then make it smaller and easier to work with. So a Codex is a hardware and software platform. It takes digital information and makes it smaller. Now, every camera tends to have a set number of codecs. Each of them is designed to work slightly differently. An example of a GH5, H.264 is designed to be really mainstream and easily editable. H.265 is designed to be really small because it's the streaming codec that most things use when they deliver files. Now, it's it's more computationally intensive, but it's very small. And something like AVH AVCHD is great for backwards compatibility. Now, what people don't tend to realize is that a codec is just a way of taking something and wrapping the audio and video together. Yeah, and we think and of them as just basically containers for video and audio, Jack. Yeah, absolutely. And for example, if you're choosing the container, so it's and a GH5, for example, is all recording in H.264, unless you're going to choose H.265 or AVCHD. Um, but people will say, well, gee, what quality mode is better? .mpeg, um, .mp4, which is .mpeg, or .mov. It's the same quality in terms of video. The only difference is going to be the way the audio track is captured. The days of this is a Mac file versus a PC file are long over. 
The idea here is .mov will have some provisions for higher quality bit depth, which is really important if you're using an S1H or a GH5 and the XLR audio adapter. So, Brandon, you love television. You, you, you've owned a plasma, you own an OLED, but do most people realize that most of the colors they see on a streaming con on streaming content or some discs or are compressed? No, and you would think that they would because it's it's something that's streaming itself, but you are losing color information. And I think that when people see what an actual calibrated monitor looks like or a studio master, they would see a huge difference in the amount of color that they're looking at. Yeah, absolutely, because you can't ma master, you know, change your monitor for every single movie. So we have to use standards. Now, in 420 color, which is a lot of cameras, what they're actually having to do is mix RG, um, so first of that four, that's Luma, that's brightness information. And those next two numbers are basically like chroma or color information. And what they're actually having to do is mix the color information on multiple lines to say, oh, this is red or this is blue or this is purple. That doesn't always lead to the best quality. Now, if we're at 422, you're going to pull color information off every line. This is also why it's really important if you have a camera that supports 422 color, it's much better then you're going to have 420 color because you're getting twice as much color information. Yeah, and, and accuracy especially is going to be very, very important in developing an artistic look for yourself. Say you're, you want to have a certain kind of LUT that you want to apply. Um, having those color tones is going to be something very important. So right, first we got to capture the color, then we got to keep the color, and that's what bit depth is. Bit depth is the number of colors that you're keeping. So JPEGs are the best example of 8-bit color. If I'm going to go into Microsoft Paint, world's best image editor. Um, our values, red values, are from 0 to 256. Blue values, B, are going to be from 0 to 256. Green is going to be 0 to 256. 256 times 256 times 256 is 16.7 million million colors. That's 8-bit color. And that's great until you need to provide corrections. 10-bit color is a much bigger box of crayons. It's 1,024 values times 1,024 values times 1,024 values. This means McDonald's red is going to look completely different than Pixel Connection red, although they both tend to use reds. This is going to give you much better identification for things like professional quality of video, but I look at for corrections. It's also going to prevent you from having banding in your scenes, whether you're doing green screen work, or even just shooting a landscape. Now, TJ asked about this earlier, Brandon, so why don't we talk about compression? What is long gop compression or group of frames, and how is it different than all I? So it's it all happens has to do with the way that the information is encoded, whether it's going to be every other frame or whether it's going to be certain frames that are done individually, and that and that's really where the terms come from. Whether it's long got, which is group of of, of pictures, or it's going to be uh, all I, which is an all intra type of compression. Right. And if you remember only one thing about all I, I'll let you continue. Is all I? I think of individual. Every frame is individual. Yeah, and Jack, we have on the right-hand side one of our camera menus, and they all seem to offer a ton of different uh, options in terms of compression. And I guess it all really has to do with the the work that's being done and where it's going to be played, and not to mention our computer's capabilities of handling the file sizes, right? Yeah, and, and that's the, the, big, the big, biggest misconception that we run into. If you actually use one of our higher quality settings, um, 400 megabits is actually going to be, that's all I, is actually going to be easier on your computer than going 150 megabits um, that's a long gop. And that's because your computer does not have to cross-reference each and every frame off each other. So this is a question of, if you get a larger file, the larger file will be more fluid than the smaller file, where you literally have to compare keyframes all the time. So again, it, it might be bigger, and you might have to go with, get a bigger memory card, a pixel connection, but it's going to be more fluid when you actually be playback. Yeah, you're certainly saving yourself a lot in the workflow. Now, Jack, it just speaks to the quality of some of the cameras that we offer here, whether they be the consumer-level cameras or even the cinema-type cameras. The amount of, uh, of codecs that they have for support, the amount of resolution that they capture, the color, and the compression capabilities is why the, and when offering all of that with unlimited record times and no overheating is a big deal for Panasonic. Absolutely. We, we're, we, we stand by reliability. And one of the great things is if you get a camera from Pixel Connection, you register it. We even have a three-year warranty. It's awesome. Um, and Compression, Jack, this is one of our uh, Panasonic memory cards, but the amount of space that you want to have, it, it's better to have a specific type of card. And this one tends to have some verbiage on it, called like a V90 card with a read and a write speed. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. So 
if you're buying a memory card, these read and write speeds on it, those are maximums and those are burst speeds. If you get something that says V90 or V60, that is sustained throughput of 60 or 90 megabytes a second. This means instead of 0 to 60 speed, it's cruise control. If you get something that says U3, that's 30 megabytes a second, which isn't always possible for the best quality of image. It doesn't always have the ability to record in something like a 400 megabits all I. The card just won't read fast enough. Then we, every time we see that class 10, we think it's probably time for a card upgrade. Class 10 is up to uh, 10 megabytes a second, which is probably not recommended for most cards today. Yeah, and again, if it does not explicitly state a V60 or a V90 card, we do not recommend using them for specific video applications just because it's not going to be sustained. And it may have the proper read and write speeds, but again, sustained speeds is what we're looking for with that certification that we get in V90 or V60. Now, if we're recording on memory cards, we do have other options that Panasonic offers for, for certain cameras, right, Jack? Yeah, absolutely. And the good news is if your camera has two card slots, generally speaking, you, the, you can actually record to one of the card slots as well as out to the clean HDMI. Um, a recorder will give you an all I codec in most cases. Um, the codecs are determined by the recorder, but most recorder manufacturers are really good at doing that. And that will allow you to record to things like SSDs. Solid state drives are very fast. They're very affordable. But I still record to a card at the same time because I want a backup. The nice thing is we'll also be able to add additional functionality sometimes. For example, the S1H will have a future firmware update that will allow ProRes RAW. Now, speaking of using those external video recorders and monitors, those do give me the ability to use something called LUTs and see them in, in real time when I'm looking on the screen, right, Jack? Absolutely. A LUTs, all it is is a three-dimensional color map. Uh, for with lightness and darkness, what it'll allow you to do is translate values that you capture into a preset or a look. Um, and then again, LUTs are great for previewing. You can just use it as a preview and you record flat and then go to your editor and uh, record. For example, if I was going to do web content, I tend to shoot in uh, Rec. 709 because that's the TV standard. And I know across mobile devices that color is going to be very consistent across it. Yeah, absolutely. And again, if we're shooting at something like Vlog, Though. logarithmic color profiles, Jack. Um, what are what are some of those? I know we, Panasonic offers two different versions of this. We we offer the V-Log, we offer the V-Log L between the two. Well, it's the same curve. It's just going to, um, a V-Log L is going to have two less stops of dynamic range. So it's going to be around 12 stops of dynamic range to more than 14 plus. I don't think it's a really big deal. I think what the bigger deal is really, how do I expose for this? And Brendan, I think you have the next slide, is how do you expose for V-Log to make sure you get a really good image? And do you use a color chart? Uh, definitely using color charts is always going to be a must. V-Log itself is a very interesting thing. And the way it's captured, you would almost think that you want to make sure you just properly expose and that's the way it's going to look. But the big thing with, with logarithmic profiles is going to be the amount of highlight recovery that you can get and the amount of noise that you can keep low in the shadows themselves. And most people underestimate the amount of dynamic range that you have in something like V-Log or V-Log L. So I would always overexpose between one and one and a half stops. And this way I have lots of leeway in my shadows and control of the highlights. Absolutely. And the key there is you want to control your highlights. Because, Brandon, if you blow out a highlight, are you ever going to get it back? No, it, it, it's possible, but it can be very tough to do. So you, you want to make sure you, you control that. Something like the S1H, if I'm shooting in the raw profiles, you can recover the highlights a little bit better. But again, you always want to make sure you're not too overblown. Yep. And this is what we kind of talked about coming soon. We'll have ProRes RAW. And that'll be a free firmware update. Like we had the previous update. Stay tuned for that. So in-camera color profiles. We offer a lot of different color profiles, Jack. Cine like D or Cine like V. Uh, even like uh, 709 color codecs. And if I'm in a rush, if, I'm, if I don't need to do any kind of logarithms color profiles or, or LUTs themselves, these are also very valid to use. Yeah, if I have a G85 and I want to, you know, I have a G7, I'm just getting started and I don't, you know, I don't know what log is. I don't know how to correct for it. I don't have the software. You know, you remember that, you know, free software doesn't tend to edit 10-bit files. I can start in best by using something like Cinelike D, which is going to be really dynamic and bold and really look good out of camera. And it'll look great. Um, and I have things I like for interviews. I got a portrait mode that looks great. But yeah, if I've got a, a G9, or sorry, not G9, a, a GH5S or a GH5 S1H, I also have a 709 like gamma curve. And again, it's it's about consistency. This is my favorite way to do things before HLG came out. And we'll talk about HLG because HLG 
is going to be HDR video, and it's standardized HDR video. And, and Brendan, we both like this because you can get much better highlight control, and you don't have to worry about clipping, and it just looks good out of camera. Yeah, HLG is is also pretty easy to master nowadays because you're seeing a lot of video support and in the software realm for HLG. Yeah, absolutely. And what we're talking about in this slide is the great thing about HLG here is that it's an HDR video that actually has color provisions for standard uh, standard dynamic range. So again, you can shoot an HDR now; it'll look good in standard dynamic range. Everything will be basically exposed properly. But when things migrate to these higher brightness displays it will look fantastic. This is a good idea to future-proof your work and kind of, you know, getting more value for your client now. Yeah, and again, because it's doing HDR, it's rendering both the brighter and the darker areas at the same time, so it really helps with your, your exposure. Absolutely, and we just point out that we're using HLG here. It can even be used for photos, but this is a standard. This is um, used by the BBC and NHK, which is the Japanese broadcaster. We mentioned the fact that it's from 2016 because this is not a new format. It's just more and more devices now support it. It's a really great technology. If your camera has it, I highly recommend you try it because of things like this. It will really help you fight overexposure in tricky environments. Um, and again, it, it looks great for the web. I think HLG presented in 60p is some of the best looking web video I've ever used. Yeah, and again, in terms of that support, if you're buying a new television set, most of the time it's going to be a 4K HDR compliant set. And if you're even watching, uh, let's say something like YouTube, YouTube does have the ability, even on cell phones, tablets, to see something in HDR itself now. Absolutely. So we have a lot of new software. Panasonic Lumix Tether support um, has been out for Windows now, Jack. It has. So, um, so t Lumix Tethers um, for streaming is, uh, is a beta that we've announced, and then it'll support, you can see, the GH5, the GH5S, the G9, S1H, S1R. And um, we actually have now have announced the other day that the beta is now available for the Mac. All you have to do is download this, um, and it'll be great. What you have to do is put your, stream your serial number in there, and then you'll be able to create this as a virtual device, use something like OBS, and use it for streaming. Uh, we also announced in the press release we'll actually be supporting our newest camera, the soon to be shipping uh, G100. What the great thing about the G100 is, you know, if you're looking for a vlogging camera, it's just a really great vlogging camera. Uh, TJ, hopefully you're you're listening. You just did a you did a couple first looks on the G100, and uh, we have some really great pre-order specials. Oops, sorry, I was muted. Yes, 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 and I actually did test the um, G100 with the. Uh, Windows side for the, um, or I'm sorry, the GH5 and the streaming, uh, but that's awesome that it's coming to the more entry level stuff uh, and being able to, you know, use cameras that we already have to do live streams like this. I think it's Absolutely. awesome that Lumix as well as you know, other companies are doing that. So now that it's on the Mac, even better. Yeah. And these are betas. We want to note that. So uh, there'll be future updates to further per perfect these down the road. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. That's all that we have for, for, kind of slides. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll turn over control to you, TJ. Super de duper. Um, so let's see what we got here. What's your recommended ENG camera for something like weddings, Mr. Joey? Uh, uh, the HCX2000. I love that, that camera. Uh, it's going to be 4K up to 60 frames per second. Um, it also has the ability to do uh, SD basically live streaming so i could even uh, use this get on the network and stream it out to the world yeah and again it, it might be a little tough to find because a lot of people have figured out that this camcorder is so phenomenal so there is another version of it which is the 1500 but it does not come with the xlr audio capabilities that the other one has it's an add-on um but the 2000 is going to be the one i would recommend as well Jay. excellent excellent uh and you cover this a little bit so um can, can i get my, my sleeper pick too TJ? Yeah, for sure. My sleeper for sure. pick for E and G. And this is where those things were, you know, be come inside and let T and when is the FZ2500. The yes. FZ2500 is a fixed lens camera, one inch sensor, tons of zoom. Uh, um, and it does as a built in ND filter. If I was looking for a B camera for ENG, this is my favorite ENG camera at under a thousand bucks. It's incredible. 100%. Yeah. Small, compact. TJ, you know the size of the camera. It's, it's fantastic. Okay. And it swings above its weight because it does have the ability to install a VLOG element in it as well. 
And does it have, remind me, it's been a minute, um, Vector or uh, the other scopes? It does not. Yeah. But it does have a clean HDMI out. So, hey. Nice, nice, nice. Well, cool. I think that is all the questions that we had, guys. Um, if you do have uh, any questions, please let me know. And also, if you're looking for more classes, we just updated about, I don't know, 10 or 15 classes on our website. If you go to the pixelconnection.com slash classes, you'll be able to find those. They are happening every week. Um, so if you need anything from us, please sh shoot us an email, sales at the pixelconnection.com. You can find us on Instagram at the.pixel.connection or on Facebook. Just search for the Pixel Connection. Again, th guys, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. And next time I do my uh, rap videos, I will be I will be ready. And I, and I thank you for TJ. that. We want to see your magic tricks. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you guys so much. And I hope everybody has an awesome rest of their week. We'll talk soon. Thank you, guys.